And welcome to Discovery Church today. How many of you guys excited to be in God's house? Amen. Wherever you're joining us online or in the house, excited that you are here for a series we started last week where we are diving into the book of James, the entire book. This is probably going to take us as I have kind of broken it down myself. It probably is going to take us about nine weeks to, to we'll see what God does, but, but we want to take it slow here and get everything God wants us to get out of the scriptures. So if you did miss Last week, how many enjoyed last week? How many enjoyed last week? Part one, trials and temptations. Y'all got to check that out because as we're taking the whole uh, book of James in verse by verse and chapter by chapter, we need to stay in context to what James is talking about. So James begins this book and he jumps right in and he starts talking about trials. He says, consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters. When you endure, you go through trials of of many kinds because you know that the testing of your faith, it produces this thing that God is trying to do inside of you. It's producing perseverance. And so we talked about, about trials and temptations, but in verse number one, and we kind of just went over it very quickly, but in verse one, he addresses the letter to the believers, the believing Jews who were scattered abroad outside of Israel, outside of Jerusalem, and I kind of want to give you some insight as to why I chose the book of James in this season of what God is doing in our life, in our church, in our city, in, in, our, in, the, in the kingdom of, of heaven. I believe that this is so relevant. James, what James has to say is so relevant to what we are experiencing in our world today, because just like those believing uh, Jews were scattered because of persecution and they weren't able to remain in, in, in Jerusalem or in Israel. I believe that today there is a unique, a different kind, but a similar kind of scattering in the kingdom of God. That there is a, a scattering of, our, of, of, of people's faith, of where they're going to church. If they're, if they're going to church at all right now, the pandemic and the quarantines and the politics and, and the fighting and the division and all that stuff has kind of shooken and scattered people. And what we need is to find something solid in the middle of it, you guys. We need to come back to something solid. And that's where James, I think, is pulling us back. He's speaking to a church that has been shaken, that has seen persecution, that has seen political devastation, that has seen injustice and, and, and prejudice. And, and he's speaking to them to try to bring them back to something solid. And so we're beginning today. We're going to finish up James chapter one. And the focus today, here's what I want to do today. Today, I'm going to read you like, I want to start off reading the, all the rest of James chapter one. And then we're going to do some Bible study. I just want to, I want to pull out some things and hopefully you're taking notes today. You got your note handouts. I'm going to have you maybe circle underline, show you some meanings of some words. We're just going to do some Bible study and then we're going to get really practical. Okay. Like, because really at the heart of James, James is all about doing what the word of God is telling you to do and really practical in the way that he's presenting faith. So, so we got to let this thing do what he wants it to do and what the word, he wanted to apply it to our lives. So we're going to get really practical as well. We're just not going to study it, man. We're going to apply it to our life. Can I get an amen, somebody? So the emphasis in this section, as I'm, I'm going to read, let me just, James chapter 1, we're going to read verse 16 all the way to 27. The emphasis, two emphasis, and I'm gonna, I highlighted them up here. You can underline or something like that in your book. The first emphasis is on this word deceive. Someone say deceived. It's, it's self-deception is the first emphasis that James is trying to, to uh, shine some light on because it's one thing if Satan deceives you. It's one thing if we were deceived by the lure that we talked about, the bait, the temptation of the end. That's one thing, but it's an entirely different thing to fall into your own deception. In fact, I, it, is, it is much worse to fall into your own deception, to deceive yourself in living in betrayal to yourself than following the temptation of Satan. Okay, all right. So here's, here's the first one is deceived. Don't be, he goes, don't be deceived, my dear brothers and sisters. Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of heavenly light. So basically he's saying, look, if it's good, God deserves the credit and the glory. If it's evil, stop looking at God and blaming him for that. 
He's not the author of evil in your life. He's not, the, he's not the author of that temptation in your life. Everything good, you need to give God the credit, God the glory, who does not change like shifting shadows. He chose to give us birth through, and here's the second topic, and this is probably the main one. Self-deception is, is a main thing, but, but he says, he uses this, this phrase, the word, five different times in this section. Five times James is talking about the word or the word of truth. He chose to give us birth through the word of truth that we might be a kind of first fruits of all he created. My dear brothers and sisters, he says, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry because human anger does not produce the righteousness that God desires. Therefore, get rid of all the moral filth and the evil that is so prevalent, meaning it's, it's, it's rampant, it's out there, it is, it is numerous, and humbly accept the word, there it is again, planted in you which can save you. Do not merely listen to the word, and so there it is, deceive yourselves. Do what it says, he says. Anyone who listens to the word, and that one should be highlighted, Whoop, highlight that one. Anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like someone who looks at his face in a mirror. And after looking at himself, he says, go ahead. After looking at himself, he goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. But whoever looks intently into the perfect law, and that perfect law is the word. That's what he's talking about. It's the word of God, the perfect law that gives freedom and continues in it, not forgetting what they have heard, but doing it, they will be blessed in what they do. Today, the topic or the title of today's message that I want to give to you is how to be blessed by the Bible. How many of you want to be blessed by God? How many of you want your experience with God's word to be fruitful, to be, to be blessed, that you would receive a blessing from your time in God's word? You know, today in America, today in the world, the, the word of God is so much more available than any other time in all of history. You have more opportunities to hear and to receive the word. You got videos and podcasts and YouTube and social media and books. There's all this content out, yet, out there, yet many people are missing the blessing of it. There's a, there's a lot being consumed, but isn't producing any fruit of blessing. Um, and this Bible, your Bible is a book of tremendous blessing. There is a tr there's tremendous blessing available to us in the word of God. There is power and peace and comfort and strength and guidance and purpose, but it's not automatic. It doesn't come by you just owning a Bible, right? You can't just own a Bible and get the blessing of the Bible. You can't, and you can't just read it or hear it and get the blessing of it. James is telling us that your blessing is connected to your attitude toward the word of God. That's, what, that's what's connected. He's trying to, he's trying to draw us in here and, 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 and don't be deceived. Don't be deceived. You want to be blessed. I know you do. You'd rather pretend to be blessed than actually blessed. Stop being deceived. You can actually be blessed. Like you, you can do that. You can be fruitful and blessed by God if you change your attitude toward his word. Then he goes on and he says, those who consider themselves religious... Because it's the deception, right? They consider themselves religious. And I go to church. I'm a Christian. I'm a believer. My dad was. My brother is. My grandma was. And been going to church for how many years? And, and, and I've been to actually every one of them in, in Bakersfield, by the way. I just, I just, yeah. That's how religious, that's how Christian I am. I've attended all the church. Okay. Those who consider themselves religious and yet do not keep a tight rein on their tongues deceive themselves. And their religion is, he says, worthless. And this is a topic that comes up again in James chapter 3. We're going to cover that in entirety in James chapter. Right? I have an installment of, uh, of this series called Taming Your Tongue. All right? And how much power. Like, it, and if you don't, the consequences and how you actually can. He goes on. He says, look, if you're not doing that, what's the use? Your, your religion is worthless. Religion that comes from God our Father compared to the one you're just kind of 
you're, you're living without that blessing that, you, that you're just kind of, you're in it, you hear it, but you don't got the blessing. So that's just empty religion, worthless religion. The religion from my God, the religion from my father accepts, that, that he accepts is pure and faultless is this, to look after orphans and widows in their distress Amen. and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. If you have the right attitude towards the word of God, it has the power to anchor you in every storm in every crisis, in, in, in your scattered life. I'm telling you, throughout whatever scattering that we will have to go through in our culture, in society, in our future, the word of God is what is going to anchor you. I'm telling you, more than anything else that you need as a follower of Jesus, in the middle of your crisis, in the middle of your, your trials and temptations and scattering is the word of God, staying connected to his word. Amen. So, when your Bible talks about the word, let me just take a time out and just give you a little bit of a study here on, on just what it means, the word of God. When James is using that word, word, he's using a Greek word throughout the New Testament. It's used most often when you hear the word, the word of God or the words of God. There's two different words though that you need to be familiar with. And, and I wanna show you this because some of you operate in one more than the other and you actually need to operate in both. There's two words that the Bible uses, logos and rhema. How many of you ever heard of those words before? Logos, rhema. Let me, let me explain to you what logos and rhema is. When James is talking about logos, here's, this is what he's, when he's saying word every time in James, and James that we just read all the five times, says word, 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 word. He's using this word logos. And what that means, it's the constant voice of God or the consistent, constant voice of God, the written word of God. It's constant, it is written, it's there. And aren't you thankful for the written voice and will of God that we actually have a salvation that is spelled out for us, a gospel of good news that we can come back to the logos, the written will and word of God. That's what he's referencing here. But, but you also do need to know, and I just wanna take a moment to teach this. You also need to know the rhema word of God. And, and where the logos is the constant, the rhema is the instant. It is, it is the instant voice of God. It is the personal speaking of God. Now, now both of the, God operates by both. He, he wants to speak to you personally and instantly, but you also need something constant and consistent, okay? And so the, the rhema is used it's not used as much as logos in the scriptures, but it is used quite often. In fact, Jesus, when he was led into the wilderness, when he was enduring that temptation of Satan, he actually says in Matthew chapter four, it's not in your notes, but he tells Satan in Matthew chapter four, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every what? Word that comes out, that proceeds out of the mouth of God. That word is the rhema. So man shall not live by bread alone, but, but God wants you to live by the instant, personal voice of God. Isn't that amazing that God wants you to act, he wants to actually speak to you personally, that he wants to give you some rhema, some insight. Both the logos and the rhema are crucial for your Christian life. God uses his logos word to speak his rhema word. And God's living, instant speaking, listen, is always corresponding and never contradicting to the Logos word. It is, it's, it's never contradicting. It always corresponds to the written word of God. In the Bible, the written word of God today is under attack. It has actually always been under attack, but we can see it in our generation, can't we, that the word of God is under attack attack. It constantly is. And you may not know it, but the, but forces of evil are constantly trying to write in law against what the Bible teaches so that it, so that they can silence the church and silence the will of God. Like this is constantly happening in our, in our culture. It's under attack. And I am concerned as a pastor that, that what, what the scattering and shaking of last year did to us, I am concerned that people do not know the word, that they don't understand the word, that they don't study the word, that they don't believe the word of God. And not doing this, not doing this will destroy your faith. Listen, and the enemy knows it. 
The enemy knows he can destroy our faith by taking the, the logos, by taking the, because if we don't have the logos, there is no measuring for rhema. There is nothing constant and consistent for the personal will and voice of God in my life to come back to, to measure it to. He knows that he can destroy our faith. And the enemy knows it. The very first words that come out of Satan's mouth or actually have to do with this. In, in the Garden of Eden, in, in the middle of God's blessing, in the middle of, of this perfect place, the first thing that Satan says, and, the, and this is why it's important that it's the first thing, you guys, that Satan says, because it sets the tone and, and direction of the schemes of the enemy. It's the very first thing he says. And that kind of sets it off, his tone and direction. Look at Genesis 3, 1. The first recorded words of Satan in the Bible. Did God really say that? He's questioning and he will constantly question the will of God, the word of God, the voice of God in our life. He's always can, trying to remove the power of God's word in your life. And if you start questioning, like, well, how do you remove the power? The word of God is power. How would you remove the power? The word of God only has power in your life if you agree with it. It comes in agreement. That's why, that's why there's, there's you, some people can read it and be blessed, and some people can hear a message and not be blessed and not get the fruit of it. It comes just like, so James, again, consider it pure joy, my brothers, when you endure trials of, of many kind. The, the power is in the agreement with God of why these trials are here. It's producing perseverance, character, and faith in my life. God, I'm gonna agree with you in this, but if you stand in disagreement, you will not produce the character that God wants to produce in the trial, okay? So there's, I gotta, I gotta agree with God's word and the enemy. The enemy knows that. The single greatest discipline that you need in your life in the middle of your trials and testings and temptations is a commitment to the word of God. And here's the challenge. The problem is we have a generation that think they know more than God. We, we have a generation that's trying to pick and choose what about the word do I accept or want or like? And and because when God was saying that, I mean, he wasn't taking, you know, 2021 modern, what is socially acceptable now? I mean, the most social norms then and now differ so much and laws have changed so much now. And so, so they want to pick and choose what parts of the Bible and the word of God to follow. And really what they're doing is they're following their feelings right. instead of something constant unchangeable. He, 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 James says he doesn't change like shifting shadows. You need something constant and consistent. James is trying to bring him back to this. And we have, a gen, we have a generation that's living hedonistically that God wants me to be happy. No, he don't. God wants you to be holy. He wants to do a work inside of you. Proverbs 16, 25. This, I read this verse last week. Let me give it to you again. There is a way that seems right to you. But in the end, it leads to death. This verse is why I never feel the pressure to convince anyone of the Bible or God's truths is true. I don't feel the pressure at all because life will teach you that God's truth is truth. I'm talking to someone I'm like, I don't believe what you believe. That's all right. I'll leave the light on for you. You'll be back. Because life will show you that what you, okay, I'm not going to argue with you and debate with you. Like this is, that, it'll, it'll teach you. There's no pressure in this at all. James says, once you understand the difference between the trial and temptation, he goes on to say, you need to have the right attitude toward the word of God and stop deceiving yourself. Stop deceiving yourself and have the right attitude. He basically is asking this question. And I love how James just, he constantly, he's a very confrontational communicator and writer. He's like, you know, you're going through trials, here you go. This is you change your attitude, okay? And here again, he's confronting the self-deception and our approach to the word of God. And he's basically asking this. He's saying, what is going to be the basis for how I live my life? Is it the world or the word? What is the basis of how you live your life, of the decisions you make, of the goals you, you have, of, of how you parent, of how you work, of how you spend your money, of how you, 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 your priorities, your attitude, your time, your whatever. What is the basis of how you're going to live your life? Is it the word world or is it the word of God? David responds to this in Psalm 119. He says, my soul is weak from waiting for you to save me, but my hope is based on what? 
It's on your word. I am going to have storms in my life. I'm going to have trials. I'm going to have uh, uncertainties and difficulties. But I have got an anchor in the middle of it. I have my hope on your word. I can't change the trials. I can't change the storms. But what I can change is my attitude towards God in the middle of it. And I can put my hope on your, on your word. There's no single greater discipline to survive in the crisis than knowing your word, church. Knowing your word. Matthew chapter 7, Jesus actually says, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice. So you're not just a hearer, you're a doer, Jesus is saying. You're a doer of it. I mean, you got to put them into practice. Is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rock is his words. That's what he's saying. It's my word. It's my word. It's the words I'm telling you because the rain is going to come. The rain is going to come and beat against your marriage. It's going to beat against your, your soul. It's going to beat against your emotions. It's going to rise and the winds are going to blow all over your life. Yet it did not fall Amen. because it had its foundation on the word of God, on the rock of God. I love my Bible. I love my Bible, church. I really do. It's one of my, one, probably the, like my favorite, if I could pick a favorite, I don't know, that sounds weird. If, probably one of my favorite parts of my relationship with God is his word. It really is. I love my Bible. I love to read it. I love to study it. I love to, uh, I love to know it. I love to, it, it, it shows me his character and his heart and his personality. It reveals, it convicts, it draws. I love it. I mean, I love prayer. Like I love prayer. I do, but I would much rather have God talk to me than me talk to God. That's just me. That's just, me. but I, I, I love it. I love the word of God. I love reading it. I love studying it. I study the Bible. I study the Bible every, every day. I'm studying the word of God, but I study for you church on Wednesday. On Wednesday is my, like from six, it's like a 6 a.m. to 5 p.m. kind of day for me where I am totally immersed in the word of God and studying the word. I love to go to my, my desk and my chair and, and spend time in the word of God and letting the word of God speak to me. I want you to have the right attitude. Here's, here's my, my goal today. The goal today that I have in this message is that you would love your Bible and that you would make it your standard. That's the goal. Now I'm going to share, we're going to study there, but I'm just, I'm telling you my hope behind uh, nothing up my sleeve. My whole hope today though, is that you would love your Bible and that you would make it the standard of your living. I, I want you to have the right attitude toward the Bible, that it's life-giving, it's pure, it's because it's, it's not a book. It's, not, it's, it's the expression of God. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. James gives us three attitudes that we, can, that we need to have toward the Word of God if we want to be blessed. Write them down. Here they are. Number one, the first attitude, to gratefully receive the truth that saves me. Then you will know the truth, Jesus says, and the truth will what? Set you free. To know the truth that saves me. James chapter one, let's start off verse 16 again. Don't be deceived, he says, my dear brothers, every good and perfect gift is from above coming down from the Father. Some people will try to convince you, the enemy will try to convince you that, that, that God is boring. Oh, if you follow God, it's gonna be a boring life. He ain't no fun. You might go to heaven, but you're going to hate the journey. No, that's not the truth at all about the word of God and God. Serving God is not a duty. It's a delight, you guys. I mean, knowing God is the best part of my life, not the worst part. Like, this is what James is saying here. Everything good, it comes from it comes from God, from knowing him. Our God of, he's every good and perfect, comes from above, from down from the father of heavenly lights who does not change like shifting shadows. He chose that gave us birth through the word of truth that we might be a kind of first fruits of all he created. The Bible is the instrument that led you to Jesus. It is the good news. It is, it is the expression of God, of the gospel that led every single one of us to him. Romans chapter 10 says it this way, that says so that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. 
See, some of you are even here today. You're, you're here today and you're going to be hearing the scriptures and hearing these truths and principles and something is going to happen inside of your heart, inside of your mind, some shifting, some convicting. And you're going to, you're going to go, some of you are going to be like, I need that. I need, I, that's what I need today. God is going to draw that out of you that we might be, he says, a type of first fruits. Now, we don't use that language today in our day. Most of us don't make our own commodities or anything like that, but they did. In the biblical times, they often did. And they all, as an act of worship, they brought the first back to God. This is where we get the, the tithe comes from, is, is bringing the first of our income back to God. But it, this first fruit and this principle that James is talking about and the Bible teaches is not about money. It's not about money. That's not, it's, just a port, it's just a part of it. It's about like every area of my life, I'm going to bring God the first and the best because he is the, the author of everything good and perfect is come from him. Therefore, I'm going to return it gratefully to God. I'm going to, the reason why you're in church today, I always tell people, the reason why you're in church on the first day of the week on Sunday is a type of first fruits. It's giving God the first of your time, the first of your week. Before you do anything else, you're saying, God, here is my first. I'm going to give you my first and my best. It's an attitude. It's an attitude that we, because everything good, it's come from you. We don't, we don't have the attitude of like, oh, I guess I'm not going to sin anymore. I don't want to. I kind of like it, but I'm not going to because I want to go to heaven. No, that's not what we, it is. It is God. I willingly surrender my life to you because you are so good and your way is better. Amen, church? James continues and he says, once you've gotten saved, how many people are grateful that you don't have to pay for your own sins anymore? Amen. Anyone grateful? Okay, okay, just checking. Just checking if I'm talking to the right people. I thought so. But James says, once you've, once you've gotten saved, he says, don't stop there. Here's the second truth, second attitude that produces blessing in your Bible and in your word is to humbly accept the truth that confronts me. I don't know, we don't like to be confronted, but, but God likes it. God likes to confront us with his truth. And the key word here is humbly, though. Humbly. Why humbly? Because a lot of us have pride when it comes to what we think is true. What we think doesn't fit in with our culture and with our beliefs and with society. And, and, and he starts off in verse 19 with the most, probably the most, one of the most disobeyed verses of the entire Bible. I don't know if you'd agree with me, but verse 19, he says, My dear brothers and sisters, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen. How many of us do that? Like, huh? Slow to speak. Yeah, there again. Like, how many of you actually do that? And slow to become angry. Now, this is such great advice for every area of your life, isn't it? Like in, like in your relationship, in your marriage. Your marriages would be so much better if you just would be quick to listen and slow to speak and slow to become angry. That would solve 90% of your problems. Of honestly, all of your relationships, your friends, your boss, your coworkers, like all of your relationships, 90% of the problems. So this is like, this is really good advice to anybody, but, but I want to show you the context here again to bring it into the context of James chapter one. What is he saying here? It does apply to your marriage, applies to every relationship. But here James is telling us, hey, you got trials and don't be deceived, man. Here's what's happening in your trials. You need God to produce this. Here's temptations and God, God's not the author of it. The enemy is. Don't be deceived because here's how the enemy wants to tempt you. And here, stop being deceived. Here's your approach to the word of God and how the word needs to be applied to your life if you want to be blessed by it. And then in the middle of that, he goes, look, everyone needs to be quick to listen and slow to speak. What he's, what he's talking about here in the context of James is he's saying, if you want this, listen, you need to be quick to listen to the word and slow to speak your opinion. This is, this is what James is referencing here. Now it can be applied, this verse can be applied to, and, then, and James is actually intentionally saying it this way so it can be applied to every aspect of our life. But what the context is telling us here is that we need to be quick to listen to the word and slow to speak our opinion before we get God's thoughts on it. That if we want it, and this is the key, this is the key to not being deceived, this whole self-deception thing, because most of us are doing this backwards and that's why you're deceived. You're, you're being, 
you're being slow to listen and quick to speak. And James right here tucked into this in verse 19 is giving you the secret to not be deceived. And, and the reason why you are walking in a type of self-deception, that your ears are not hearing. You got deaf ears, man. You're just talking way too much. And you are, this is a recipe for self-deception. Be quick to listen, slow to speak. Hey, you got trials, you got temptations and stuff? Don't be quick to get angry. When the word of God confronts your life and challenges your life and you go, ooh, ah, mm, ah, I don't know if I like that. Don't be quick to get angry. Don't be quick to put up a wall. Don't get mad at, at God. The, the anger here that he's referencing is, 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 the, is hurt. Mm, whether, ah, that, that hurts. I don't know if I like this anymore. Mm, mm, you want me to do what, God? Oh, I don't know if I like this anymore. Okay, so, so that, that's what he's referencing here. Because he says, human anger does not produce the righteousness that God desires. Therefore, get rid of all the moral filth and evil that is so prevalent. And there it is again. Humbly accept the word. And then he uses that a borrowed term from Jesus the word planted in you. Do you remember the parable of the sowers? The parable of the, of the sower in Matthew chapter 13. And this is definitely, I believe, what he's referencing here. The parable where Jesus said, look, he talks about this sower who scattered seed and that scattered on, some of it was a hard, hard heart, a shallowed heart, a crowded heart. There's all these things. There's all different types of soil representing our heart. And one of them was fruitful and it produced fruit. Why is it that you can have the same seed, but different location and get a different result. It's because some soils are prepared and some aren't. He says, hey, prepare, James is saying, prepare the soil of your heart. Get rid of that filth, that moral filth and, and evil. That word filth, will you like circle that or underline that word filth in your Bible or in your notes there? The Greek word is ruparion. Ruparion, here, here's what it means. It means earwax. <laughs> yeah, that's what, that's what it means. No, but it, but it makes so much sense when you apply that. He's like, what you need is a Q-tip in your life because, because that stuff that, that before, you, before there's seeding, you need to do a little weeding, okay? Before the seeding, you need to do a little bit of weeding with God and you need to get that filth that's clogging in your ears because you're not hearing the word of God correctly. It's preventing you from hearing the word of God. It's plugging up the voice. It's plugging up the sound. Humbly accept the word. Have, you have to be humble. The world and even some people in the church have pride about what they think is true. There's going to be times that when you read your Bible, you're going you're gonna to go, uh-oh. There's going to be times, like there should be some times when you read your Bible, you go, I don't like that. Ouch, or oh, or dang it, or I don't, I, like, there's, there's going to be times you use your Bible where you go, I don't, I don't know if I agree with that. Like, I don't want to do that. Like, there's, if there's not times, I love what Timothy Keller said, theologian and pastor Timothy Keller said, if your God never dif disagrees with you, then you might just be worshiping an idealized version of yourself. So look, that's what makes him God, is he can actually disagree with you from time to time, and you got to humbly Accept it. That's what makes him God and Lord in your life. Look, if you don't have those moments where you go, oh, I don't know if I want to live like that or believe like that. James says, you better humbly accept that. You better humbly make the humble decision. He says, accept it. And there's another word I want to point out to you. Accept. Accept in, in, in the Greek, what it means is to, literally means is welcome like a stranger. Okay? It's actually used in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 13. He says, and we also thank God continually because when you receive the word of God, 
which you heard from us, you welcomed it like a stranger. Like I didn't know, like I'm going to pre-decide this, come on into my house. You go ahead and do whatever you want to do. I don't know you. I didn't know this truth. I didn't get this principle. I never thought about it this way before, but come on into my house. Come on into my life. I'm just going to welcome it like a stranger. You do whatever you need to do because it's not a human word. It actually is, he says, the word of God, which is indeed at work in you who believe. So listen, it's only at work if you, it's not at work if you don't welcome it like a stranger. Let me say it this way. It won't work if you don't welcome it like a stranger. Like just come on in and do whatever you need to do. In fact, I think that the mark, here's the mark of a God changed heart is that I actually like God telling me how to live. I like that. When I see a truth that confronts and conflicts with how I live my life, how I'm treating my wife, how I'm working as an employee or as a manager, or how I'm handling my time, my parenting, my whatever, when I get that revelation, I say, ooh, thank you, Jesus. Thank, like, I I, I want you to tell me how to live because I want to live under your covering, God. I don't want to live outside of your blessing or outside of your covering. God, please tell me how to live. Amen? Amen. I humbly accept it. And even when it confronts me, I'm going to accept it. And then number three, you intently embrace the truth that guides me. You want, you want to be blessed by your Bible? You have to intently embrace. And I love that word intently. He uses it in James verse 22. He says, do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it is says. Do what it says. You know what the victory is? You know how to get victory? Victory is the distance between what you are doing and what God wants you to do. Victory is the distance between what, how you are living and how you know you should live. That, that's the distance right there. Is, uh, it, it, and some of us are deceiving ourselves, James says. Some of us are faking it. But at some point, listen, here's the self-deception. At some point of faking it, you forget that you're actually faking it. And you're just living. And you just come into church. You actually forgot that you were not living the way you should live. You fall into deception. Okay? He goes on. He says, anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like someone who looks at his face in a mirror. And James, James has this analogy. He compares the word of God to a mirror. A mirror. I love that. Because you think that you look fine. You think you look good, right? Like, oh yeah, I'm looking good today. It's Sunday, y'all, looking good and stuff. Until you go home and you go, oh dang it. I, you thought all your hairs were in place, but you had this one hanger. What's one? It was like three inches long. I don't know, like, have you ever, like, I'm like, do you even love me, honey? Do you even love me? Do I have any friends in my life that just let me, uh, how long has this been like out there waving? The, but you, you, you look, once, but when you look in the mirror, now I got it, you got a decision to make. Do you, do you think you look good or are you going to embrace that you got a hanger? <laughs> or do you, do you deal with that thing? Do you kind of pluck that thing out? Do you deal with it? You say, no, I'm fine. I'm looking, I'm looking good. No, look, because some of you hear my preaching and you're like, yeah, that's right, pastor. But you don't go pluck anything. Right. And some of you need to be pluck, you need to pluck those hangers out of your life. You know it's there. The mirror got put up to you. You know it. You felt it. You convinced. But then you leave here and and look what he says. It says after uh, looking at himself, he goes away immediately. You forget. You forget that it was even there. You forget what you look like when you look into the perfect word of God and what it revealed to you. He says, but whoever looks intently, and I love that word intently, intently, intently. You can either gaze at a mirror or you can, you can either glance at a mirror or you can gaze intently at a mirror. You can just walk by. Some of you guys just don't care. You just walk by, like, yeah, I'm good, I'm fine. You just walk, and, and, but, or you can gaze intently at that thing like your wife does and she's looking at everything, right? right? 
everything in. You can either, you can glance at the word of God or you can gaze intently at the word of God. This word is the same word that's used of, of Peter when he, was, when he went and looked inside of the empty tomb. The Bible says that Peter, he, he gazed intently. He didn't just walk by the tomb like, hmm, no, everyone, no one's there. No, no, no. The Bible says that he, he, he gazed intently. He went, oh, 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 oh. That's, that's, how, that's how your relationship with the word of God is supposed to be. You're supposed to be digging in and go, oh, oh, look, what's here? Oh my, you're supposed to be looking intently into the perfect law, he says, that gives freedom and continue in it. That's why I give you sermon note binders. Look, that's why I give you these things right here, these sermon note binders, so that you can continue in it, that you don't, that you don't, you don't look at the mirror here today and walk out and think you look good when you got hangers all over the place. You got an uneven fade. You got, you got, you got boogers in your eyes. You got, you got salad in your teeth and stuff. And dude, I'm trying to help you out. Grab that thing and look at it one more time and get to plucking. Continue in it. Don't just sit in it and get out there and forget. Continue in it. Not forgetting what they've heard, but doing it. That's who's blessed in what they do, he says. So let me tell you how to look intently and what intently looks like. And I got to be quick. Let me get very practical. You can take a picture of this, write it down. If you ever heard of the acronym SPACE Pets. Let me give you an acronym. I know it's crazy. SPACE Pets. How do you look intently into the Word of God? You use SPACE Pets. Space Pets will help you look intently into the Word of God. I didn't create this. This came from Rick Warren about 20 years ago. Uh, you know, this is how I would study the Word like 20 years. Now it's just natural, the questions you ask yourself. Here's the, you, you, when you read the Bible, you ask yourself, is there any sin to confess in this scripture, in this passage? Is there any promise to claim, attitude to change, command to obey, example to follow? Is there any prayer to pray, error to avoid, truth to believe, or something to praise God for? That's how you look intently, man. If you, if you just ask yourself these questions every time you open up your Bible, you, would, you, you wouldn't just walk by the empty tomb. you get up in it. What's here for me? What do, you, what do you have for me, Jesus? Okay, let me get, again, practical now, because this is James. James wants you to stop being deceived and actually do some things. Here, really practical. Number one, some of you guys need to just get a Bible. Get a Bible. I know you got the Bible on your app. That's fantastic. I use it too. But when I got away from my phone for these four weeks uh, in my sabbatical time and social media and I had to go back to the paper Bible, there's just something about a paper Bible, man, that's sitting on your desk waiting for you. Get a Bible. Grab a Bible. Get one. Buy one. We actually have some on order. You can get them here. I got the Life Application Bibles coming and you can buy them here at our information center probably starting next week. Okay, here's the next thing. Set aside time to read, study, and meditate on God's Word. Don't just read it. Study it. Grab a, grab a, a Bible and then grab a highlighter. Like I get a highlighter with me when I'm reading my word. Like I don't even know what I'm going to highlight yet, but I grab the highlighter in anticipation. God's going to show me something. Ooh, I can't wait. I can't wait to mark something today. What do you got for me, God? Grab a highlighter, study the word, and then meditate on the word of God. The word meditate is, is very similar, akin to the word ruminate. And, and, and what it means, what it means is it's actually literally it's the chow, the cow chewing on its cud. That's where it comes from to meditate, to ruminate on the word of God. And the way that a cow chews its cud is he actually chews it. He swallows it down into his stomach and he goes, and he brings it back up. And he starts chewing it again. And he's just trying to get everything he can out of that cut. He'll swallow it and continue. Bring it back up. Swallow it. Bring it back up. That's what it means to meditate. You just, you're swallowing it. What did he say again? What did he say again? Oh, that's good. Swallow it again. Amen. Okay. And then number, number three, have a Bible reading plan. Get a Bible reading plan. Like follow some type. Of, I want you to wake up tomorrow morning and do a plan. Like, do a plan. Like, well, I do the one-year Bible. Do a one-year Bible reading plan so you read the whole thing or get the whole Word of God in you or just a plan. Have a plan to stick to. And then lastly, don't just read the Bible. Let the Bible read you. Don't just read it. Don't just check it off, man. What are you trying to say to me, God? What's the mirror revealing? What do I need to remove as you confront my life? John chapter 13, verse 17 Jesus said, now that you know these things, 
You will be blessed if what? If you do them. Every single person in this room, you already know more spiritual truth than what you're putting into practice. Okay, James says, what are you gonna do about it? Okay, when the word of God says, husbands love your wives as your own body, what are you gonna do about it? When, when the word of God says, in everything, give thanks. In every child, consider it pure joy when you're going, what are you gonna do about that? Are you gonna apply that? Because there's a blessing on the other end of it. What are you gonna do about this, about this word? The word of God says, return 10%. Give the first fruits of my income. Tithe to the, to the house of God. What are you gonna do about it? What's gonna be your standard? The world or the word? What's gonna be the standard? When, to tell your, Bible says, share your faith and, and, and don't be ashamed of the gospel. What are you gonna do about it? Are you gonna continue to be silent not, and be ashamed? What are you gonna do? Because there's a blessing on the other end of your obedience. I got to close right there. Can I pray for you guys? Come on, just bow your heads and close your eyes all over this place. Some of you are here today and, and there is a, the mirror of God's word has, has done its work. It did its job. It kind of, kind of revealed some things and reflected some inner condition of your heart and of your soul and the condition of your spiritual health. And for some of you today, you know that you're not where God wants you to be. And he doesn't want you to just be perfect or do anything. He actually, what he wants is your heart. That's what he wants. He wants you. You don't need to follow like a list of rules or something like that. What you need is just to give your life to Jesus. The Bible says that if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, then you shall be saved. That's it. Some of you are here today and you need to make that decision. Maybe it's for the very first time to make that decision, but others of you, like the mirror has revealed that you're not as spiritually mature or even as spiritually on solid ground as you thought you were. And maybe today you need to like re-surrender and recommit your life to God. Can I pray for you first? I'm gonna pray for every one of you about the word of God and your approach to it, but I wanna start right there. If you're ready for a fresh start today and surrender the, your life to Jesus, and that's like, you know that's your next step. I'd love to pray for you. I'm not gonna have you come up or single you out or anything. I just wanna pray with you right where you're seated. And here's how we're gonna do it. I'm gonna count to three in just a moment. And at the count of three, I just want you to lift up your hand and I'd love to agree with you, pray with you right there. Come on, if that's you and you're ready for a fresh start today. One, two, three. Come on, lift that up and say, I surrender my life to Jesus. If you're online with us, type in, I need Jesus right there. Yes, yes, yes. Yes, leave it up so I can just agree and see. Come on, yeah, 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 amen. Amen all over here, yeah, yeah, yes, yes, amen, 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 amen here too. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. Go ahead and put your hands down. Will you say something like this? Even just whisper it in your seat, but use your words. Say, Jesus, forgive me of my sins and my past. Today, I surrender control. I'm not going to live my life my way. I declare today that you are my Lord, that I'm going to live my life by your will and standard, not mine. I fully surrender it all to you. Thank you, Jesus, for saving me today. I pray that you come live in my heart. Change me from the inside out. God, I pray over every person that's here today, that's listening today, that we would make a shift in our heart, in our mind, that today we commit to the standard of your word. That we will not live our life based upon what we think, based upon our own opinions, based upon our own thoughts, or the standards of this world. Today, God, we commit to your word and your standard. Help us, God, to, to, to know it and study it and have it be a foundation, something constant and consistent in our life that when this world shakes and trials shake and scattering happens that we would have your constant, consistent voice stabilizing our life. We thank you for your standard. We thank you for your word today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Come on, give God some praise if you receive that today. Amen. Amen.